Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our regular council meeting of Monday, April the 24th. Already, wow. Uh, and I would like to begin tonight by recognizing that we are meeting on the territory of the South Nation. So council, turn your, uh, turn your attention to item three, please. And that would be that the agenda for April 24th regular meeting of council be adopted as amended with the addition of release of closed meeting resolutions immediately following council verbal reports. Moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor Beddoes. All those in favor, please. That's unanimous, thank you. That brings us to item four, which is 4.1, Development Variance Permit 2174 Church Road. Uh, we have a staff report, but I'll take us over to staff or turn us to staff to take us through the report, please. Thank you. Uh, th this is a, a very short um, item here from uh, planning and development for this development variance permit. Uh, so you'll be familiar with this site. This is uh, commonly referred to as Wadhams Farm, and it's lot three, uh, also known as 2174 Church Road. You'll see here on the subject property map on the right hand side that uh, it's the first parcel uh, to the northeast of this development adjacent to Church Road. Uh, and for a flanking lot, uh, so that's uh, where the side yard now is abutting another road that's not the front yard, uh, there is an expanded setback distance, which is two meters. When this was originally planned out, um, it was being viewed as a side yard, and so that's why there's a discrepancy now, and so they need a relief of the 0.7 meters to meet that minimum uh, requirement for setback, so a variance is now being requested. It's gone through the referral process. No comments of concern have been raised. And we also reviewed it against the approved development permit and no concerns there. As well, just to the north of this, um, obviously this photo was taken prior to construction commencing on the site. <clears throat> Excuse me, the rain gardens uh, are located just north of this. And they're actually a, a physical separation to the remainder of Church Road where the sidewalks and uh, ultimate roadway is located as well. Um, there we go. So just uh, in, in full perspective of the entire Wadhams Farm development, uh, there you'll see is the uh, subject property. And then here zoomed in, you'll see on the left hand side, uh, same subject property photo without the aerial. And then on the right hand side, that's the rain garden. So that's where there really isn't any concern from staff because it's not the uh, travel lanes or the sidewalks, there's actually other uh, material such as the rain gardens and landscaping that's going to separate it. So there's a sufficient um, setback from anything else in the area. And it really just comes down to a technical matter of uh, minimum distance setbacks in the CD zone. Uh, so therefore, um, staff are in support uh, of this variance to reduce it down to 1.3 meters. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Paolo. I'll look to council for any questions regarding this matter. Any questions? Okay, so we'll now go to the public um, because this is a developments variance permit. There is a specific area for public input pertaining to this particular application and then our regular public input for the rest of the agenda will follow a little later. So if you could please turn on the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paula Johansson. I'm a neighbor of the property being developed. I'm recommending against issuing a development variance permit to reduce that building setback. Uh, the developer was aware of setback requirements when they drew up plans for where to build houses on this former farm. The developer should be aware that uh, setback requirements are not arbitrary. Uh, they do have plans for 131 other homes to construct on the site of this former farm. There's no urgent need to provide a variance for this particular one. The proposed house would be closer than permitted to uh, its lot line and the adjacent rain garden. Well, in this case, the rain garden means a settling pond during the seasonal rains. Uh, the footprint for the proposed house is currently laid out on the work site. Uh, it's much closer to the settling pond or else the settling pond is much closer to the lot line than appears on the drawings there. It wouldn't harm the developer at all to build a smaller home it might actually harm the proposed home to be built so close to the settling pond that its foundation is wet. And it would definitely set a bad precedent for issuing 
development variance permits that uh, accommodate developers for small matters like this that are certainly something they should have planned about. Thank you very much for attending and speaking with us tonight. Other members of the public? Eleanor's, uh, that the settling pond, where they want to put the settling pond, was actually a creek. I know that that was something that was discussed at, at, uh, at initially. And if you look in your maps, if you look at your maps downstairs, all your maps, any of your maps, absolutely, actually, even on your computers there, you'll see that there is a creek goes right there where it's a, a settling pond. It's actually a creek. So creeks are supposed to have 30 meter setbacks. So I don't, I don't know that there should be a variance to allow building going closer to that because it actually is a creek. If you look at your map, you'll find that. Thank you, Ms. Lurz. We, just for the viewing public, we have, not that I don't believe there's any other members of the public in the gallery at this time. I can't see behind that computer. So I'm thinking there. Could be, but I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much for the both of you for standing tonight. Follow-up questions from members of council. Go ahead, Councillor Bateman. Yeah, so through you to uh, Mr. Palau, um, anything you hear just now cause you concern regarding settling pond and, and potentially wet foundations or whether in fact this is a creek? Uh, no, certainly those were concerns that were raised during the development permit process and, and they were addressed as part of the development permit. Um, the variance before Council tonight is strictly to address the fact that during the original planning stages, um, the roadway had not been officially surveyed out yet. And so in conceptual plans, this could have been um, another parcel of land where a flanking lot uh, minimum setback would not be required. It would just be treated as a side yard and this proposal um, as presented would meet it. But however, because this was subdivided off and the adjacent boundary is to a roadway, it is now considered flanking and now must meet the two meters. So it's that process from development permit stage to building permit stage that has resulted in this and in, in that change in using the different setbacks. No other no other um, issues have been identified as a concern. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Pearson. Yes, through the chair to, to our director of planning. So I'm understanding that it's just a technical because of the, the layout of the lot, right? If that lot was anywhere else, it would still have the 1.3 meter setback, right? Correct. It's because it's a, it's a flanking lot. And so originally all of these designs, they'll have to meet the minimum 1.2 meter setback, which this would have. Right. However, just given its location, it's now technically a corner lot with church and throop. Right. It's now categorized as a flanking uh, lot line and now two meters instead of 1.2. Right. And technically there's no throop road, actually. It's not really a corner lot, is it? Uh, well, I mean, like I, by the by the by your drawings here, right? So, it, 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 it's adjacent to the future roundabout intersection component. So between rain gardens, sidewalks, yeah. the travel lane, and then the roundabout, there's multiple pieces which just enlarge a roadway normal than what we typically would see right. church road which is further south it's just a much enlarged area with rain gardens thank you other questions from for staff okay the recommendation yes oh sorry go ahead councillor mcmath so you had a member of the public bring up that it's actually a creek that runs through there so as part of the uh, the rainwater management and the overall infrastructure for this area, it's it's all being collected into drainage. So um, creeks, ditches, all of those issues were identified as part of the development permit process and the proper approvals were given. So as part of the overall rain rainwater management plan, um, it's not being affected as a as a uh, a creek adjacent to this property. It's all part of the overall drainage system for this property, which I believe goes into. Um, an, ad an adjacent system to the uh, to the east. And I think that's part of the overall roundabout construction for stormwater management uh, in this corridor. So the setback doesn't apply. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Okay, so the recommendation is that council issue development variance permit 
PLN 01691 for 2174 Church Road to reduce the building setback to a flanking lot line from two meters to 1.3 meters. Do we have a mover? Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor McMath. Would you like to comment, Councillor Pearson, into the microphone when it's turned on? Um, no, um, thanks our staff for, for explaining it. And I get, I get sometimes when these things go on these corners like that, where these, the setbacks are intended to be one way and it just becomes a technical issue. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor McMath. Any other comments? Councillor Beddoes? Since it was raised in the public, uh, remembering back when this was approved and there was a lot of, uh, discussion about the Creek. And uh, I, I wasn't very happy with the professional's uh, report on uh, that not being a, a fish bearing creek. Uh, but that being said, uh, it was accepted, uh, it was passed, and now we're all, all we're dealing with is this small uh, variance. So that's what I have to deal with. But I can sympathize that uh, that was much more of a waterway uh, in the past, uh, although at the time, when the development permit was issued, uh, the professionals said that it wasn't, and that's what swayed the day. So that's just a minor thing. Uh, not, not it's a major thing. The minor thing is a change. Uh, 0.7 meters not going to make a whole bit of difference to that whole situation. So uh, just a comment. Thank you. Other comments? I believe when the property was rezoned, even back further, it was rezoned for about 300 or so units. To be here and then since then it's been adjusted to the 133 or 140 ish 133 that is being proposed now so it is uh yeah still dense but not as dense as it was originally planned to be okay the motion has been moved and seconded i'll call the question all those in favor that's unanimous thank you okay moving on to meeting minutes we have three sets here March 27th regular meeting, April 11th special council meeting, April 11th regular council meeting. So I'd like to propose adopting all sets as circulated. Move adoption by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Beddoes. Any comments, comments, questions? See none. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, item 6.1 is report of the Chief Administrative Officer for two minutes grade. Um, thank you. I'll just be brief. Just wanted to highlight a couple things included in the report. Um, some of the events that happened this weekend. It was a busy week last week with the budget open house occurring on April 19th. Reports attached with some um, information and lessons learned from the latest uh, open house. On the weekend, there was the community cleanup room busting blitz, or sorry, not on the weekend, I guess on Friday, that, that occurred, um, and Earth Day was on April 22nd with, with various activities occurring um, at the Suit Country Market, and um, Ms. Royer Collard and Ms. Scott were at Sukarama on the 22nd and making the rounds there and engaging with lots of uh, local businesses and answering any questions for people that um, stopped by the booth. Um, from an HR perspective, uh, there's currently six vacancies um, at the district, um, including the maternity leave. Uh, we have one building inspector right now, one slash and a half planners, uh, um, one and a half-ish engineers right now. So we are very lean on those very critical, important departments. It is not unique to Souk, um, unfortunately. So uh, we are looking at any creative ways we can encourage people to, you know, come and come and work at the district, um, as well as um, in order to keep files and business moving. Um, we're looking at other options with whether it be consultants. Um, it, you know, on paper looks like a good idea, but then that involves staff time to get them up to speed, access to our system, all of these other things. So we're definitely trying to explore multiple options here to keep the files processing through the system. Um, it's just, it's tough. It's a tough environment to find people um, to come uh, and, and work anywhere. Again, if it was unique to Souk, I'd be a little more concerned. It's just a challenge when it, you talk to every muni and they have the similar concerns with those various departments. So um, we're doing what, our can, what we can to uh, promote Souk and how great it is and all the fun things we have coming up uh, to get people to encourage and qualified people to apply for these jobs. Um, from the communications aspect, 
Uh, tonight, you'll see the first quarterly report from Corporate Services um, on May 8th. I believe it's the Fire Department and Finance will be up at, at that next meeting. Um, so again, this is just something we're trying to do to get some good information out in the public on a more regular basis. Um, our communication coordinator, you know, sends lots of news letters and tweets things out, but my, maybe everyone doesn't always see that. So it's just another mechanism to give chance, uh, staff a chance to uh, pause for applause and uh, remember some of the good things that we've been accomplishing over the last quarter. Um, a couple other things, uh, boat launch parking is always a topic of conversation, especially during this time of year when the weather gets nicer and people want to get out there. Um, uh, thank you for Councillor Bateman, I believe, who forwarded a report. I didn't realize that um, one of the committees had looked into this briefly, so staff will be taking that information and providing a report to Council um, late May or early June with any potential options there. The quick answer is there's no easy solution, otherwise we would have already figured this out. Um, but we'll take the uh, work that the committee did on that and um, explore if there's any other options and just provide council and, and the community an update on uh, what we can do in that area. As um, I believe most of council heard and, and residents of Souk may have heard about the Sherwood Estates losing power. So the, the first staff heard about this was when it went, went into the media. So once we became aware of that, we had the ESS reach out to them to see if there's any other supports they needed. Sounds like Souk Embrace was one organization that really did a good job of taking care of them. Um, so as far as we know, um, they've been taken care of. They didn't need any of our direct support for that. So um, just kind of bridged the gap for that and, and made sure they knew that we were here as a resource if needed. And it sounds like they um, got what they needed and are working through to get their all their power restored. I don't know if it's been restored to date, but it sounded like they had made their connections and were getting alternative sources of power set up at their locations. Um, on that vein, uh, different vein, I guess, sorry, uh, external stakeholders, um, similar to the HR update, it's um, staff are doing their best to get back to people in a timely manner. We are, we are trying, there's just a lot of going on and there's a lot of complications. Um, and unfortunately, being short staff, it just means we can't get back to everybody as quickly as we would like to. We're definitely working on that. Um, one big piece would be uh, the development approvals grant that we have just released a tender for um, to complete the last few steps of that you know, much needed project, which will internally streamline the process, uh, which should free up some staff time to work on other files or work on different aspects of the files and just be able to turn these files around in more of a timely manner. The external facing piece of that would be a web interface that documents could be uploaded on. And we're hoping the idea behind this would be provide a more cohesive, um, connected experience for people when they're dealing with the district on permits um, that can be easily understood by, you know, the single family homeowner trying to do something on their lot as well as a complex developer. Um, so trying to find the middle ground there, it will definitely be part of it. Part of that for sure will be public engagement um, and meeting with select stakeholder groups and getting their input because part of that would be updating bylaws and stuff as well eventually. Um, so that's a big project that's underway. Um, with the goal to hopefully try and be complete this or substantially complete by the end of the year. And I'll just leave that at there for now. Thank you very much for the report, Ms. Gray. And uh, it, it just, it's a great reference point for us that, that we have to look at and, oh yeah, that's right. And we don't have to watch the webcast or I do enjoy reading your blog too, because I can always go there and find good information. So thank you. And so it's just nice to have something here. We all do. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Gray. Any questions? Go ahead, Councillor McMath. With the parking issue, what will come up that comes up every year is along Souk West Coast Road, the vehicles overstep the line. So we can have, can we have parks or hire someone else to clear the growth that comes up on the side, because if that space is cleared, the trucks and trailers can be fully on the side rather than stepping over the line. It looks like Mr. Carter would like to respond to this question. Uh, through your worship to Councillor McMath, we've gone through a design for that section of Highway 14 and the ministry will not be permissible for parking uh, to be dedicated along the highway. So staff are working on alternate solutions. We don't quite know what that looks like yet. Sorry, just sorry. Can you repeat that? Like the ministry will not allow parking there 
accommodate parking in a design once active transportation is incorporated and you have sidewalks as well as shoulders or bike lanes along the highway there will be no the ministry won't accept designs that permit parking along I'm, the highway they will not encourage that i'm not looking for a design i'm just looking for the shrubs and the trees to be cleared back there would be no signage nothing would change it would just literally be a trim so uh, that's uh, possible. We could put in that request to the highways. Okay. Okay, just to follow up though, they're not, are they anticipating doing that work this year? Like in the future, that'll occur. So I think it's more just for the, the, the growing, the short term, uh, just for the what's growing right now, because uh, then vehicles can move further over. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Go ahead, Councillor Beddoes. The clarification is suit can't go cut those branches back. That's to be Department of Highways. I know that's you asked that we do it. And the answer that I got back is that it will be put to uh, MOTI because it's their jurisdiction for them to do it. So I'm a little confused as to who's going to be cutting the bush back if the bush is to be cut back? Fair question. I think it would be low on, I'm asking on their list. So if they say, if they get a response, it's like, that's not something that we're going to do, then we could offer to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll put in a request to highways to do it. They have a maintenance contractor that will have the contract along the highway, and I'm sure they would be able to accommodate them. Okay, keep us posted. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so the recommendation be that council receive the report of the CAO for information. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Lazar Ness. All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Okay, so moving along, please. Public question and comment period. So this space is reserved for all remaining items on the agenda. So if any members of the public that are here with us tonight would like to speak, um, please come on up. And if you could reintroduce yourself just for the sequence of the agenda here. Hello, I'm I'm still Paula Johansson. <laughs> but in this particular context, I'm a member of Zero Waste Souk. And our executives have been kind of busy these days, but I've managed to, to find a moment when it's appropriate to tell you that we've uh, uh, rescheduled our intended community cleanup for uh, uh, Sunday, May 7th from 10 to 2 p.m. Uh, an email had been sent um, uh, earlier this weekend, but apparently it hasn't arrived, so I'm going to make sure that it does get sent. And uh, our, our request for funding was $750. We understand if your means won't uh, permit the full funding. If you have a portion, that would be helpful too. We're trying to to do more cleanups, uh, not so much a broom bash like happened in the park. In our case, it's picking up trash. And we have our uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Moonfist, is uh, part of the event. Um, if there's any questions you have, I can answer them. Thank you very much for the comments. May the 7th, 10 to 2. Excellent. I just wanted to comment on two things. One, um, with the open house, the staff were great. We had lots of, I had lots, I had lots of time to talk to them because there was nobody here. And that's, that's a sad part. And that happened last year too. And two to seven is just not a good time. And different people have approached me and said, it's not a good time. They're working. People are working. And it's just not a good time for them to come. And uh, interesting, I was talking to a lady today. She says, oh, I couldn't come because I couldn't bring my kids. And I know that they had some kid activities here for kids. But that wasn't advertised. It wouldn't say, bring your kids. You know, everybody, come. And I think, I know you have to do a better job because it was really, really too bad that people weren't here. They weren't here to engage and find out what's going on. So I think we better be looking at a different time. You know, as you know, Souk Road, 5 to 7 is, or 5 to 6.30 is bad, bad time to get on the road because you can't sit there for an hour. So it's 
just not a good time to have a meeting. So yeah. when is a good time, do you think? I, I think after seven or Saturdays, it's, that seems to be um, just, who knows, everybody's busy, but, but, but two to seven is just not a good time because most people are working and they have to drive. Sometimes a lot of people work even in Sydney, you know, and by the time they get back, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> So I think we have to have to look at better time, put a survey out and you know, ask people. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Okay, and the, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, I wanted to support uh, Patrick Martson's uh, letter to, at, uh, to um, council. I agree with him. I think, that, I think that that's a fair, fair comment that he has there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Okay, so we'll move on into our agenda uh, and we have our consent agenda item under eight and that would be that item 8.1 be adopted by general consent. So moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any comments, Councillor Bateman, Lajeunesse? Anything from anyone else? Councillor Pearson. the letter l item l and then there was a reply which was f i think that's how i read it l the letter was l and the reply it has a big f on the top right there big f i'm not sure what that means okay that would mean that it's item the original letter was l and the reply from staff has a big red f on it Okay, so then this would be, then it would be, you want to pull it, so it'll come to the next council meeting for discussion. Yeah, um, there's an application in here for for an event, and it looks like it's a fairly wide event, and it looks like the date is May 19th, 20th, and 21st. Do we have an opportunity to talk about this before then? Uh, let's see here, so procedurally, Mm -hmm. uh, it would then come to the May 8th council agenda. Okay. So may not be in time for the event organizers, but it's still ahead of the event. Okay. The events on May 27th. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You're right. Okay. So Councillor Pearson would like to extract that to the next regular meeting. Along with the along with the reply. Along with the reply. So yeah, I don't believe you need a second or anyone can just extract to the next agenda. Okay. okay. So then all remaining items would be received and filed accordingly. Okay. So I'll call the question on that. All those in favor, please. That's unanimous. Thank you. And that one item will flow to our next regular meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh so we okay, we're good. So moving on to I, reports 9.1 is our corporate services quarterly report. Thank you. Uh as mentioned by our CAO, corporate services is the first to present a departmental quarterly report in line with a new initiative that will see each department report out on a quarterly basis. Given that this is our first time presenting, I'll provide a bit more background information than we likely will in subsequent reports. So corporate services consists of three functions, legislative services, bylaw enforcement, and records management. We provide support to all other internal departments, including writing bylaws and policies, managing agreements, coordinating legal advice, and ensuring all statutory requirements are met. If we're not writing something ourselves, we're often involved in reviewing it. We also provide support to mayor and council in the form of agenda and meeting preparation, minutes and follow up for all council and committee meetings. Corporate services staff act as executive assistants to the mayor and CAO, coordinating meetings, authoring correspondence, supporting events and maintaining relationships with community partners. We're also responsible for records management and freedom of information requests. Aside from writing bylaws, enforcement and compliance officers form a part of our team. I have some statistics coming up in a future slide to speak to this work. Some highlights from the first quarter of 2023. The first is the development of a standard operating guideline or SOG manual for bylaw enforcement. 
When investigating complaints, officers are guided by the contents of any individual bylaw and also the bylaw enforcement policy, which speaks to our general approach to all investigations. It includes such things as timeliness of responses, confidentiality, prioritization, and discretion. The SOG manual is intended to break down these, say, 20 most common issues encountered by bylaw officers and provide a standardized approach to each specifically. This will improve efficiencies and consistency between calls. Another highlight is that we've commenced a large scale records management project that will dramatically change the way that we use technology to meet our record keeping requirements. There will be an impact on all staff members day to day work as we learn a new way of doing business, but change management and training activities are planned to support the transition. It's actually pretty exciting stuff. The next two slides provide some quantification of our work in corporate services. Our stats are slightly down over the same period last year. We will continue to track these in subsequent quarterly reports and report out on the same statistics and examine them for trends. Here I've broken down the 142 bylaw complaints received this quarter by type. As you can see, hopefully, it might be a little small on the screen. Parking is the most frequent complaint received this year with 45 calls over the past three months. Um, we do anticipate that this will increase as summer approaches. Some fun facts from our department are included in this slide. The first one references tracking legislative changes that impact local government on their journey through provincial approval processes. Current examples of this include the code of conduct requirements in the community charter and the accessible BC Act requirements, both of which we presented to council in the past quarter. Uh, Corporate services also coordinated a one day cultural exchange with students from Notori Japan who visited Souk on March 30th. The students spent the day with 15 local youth at the Souk Nation Band Hall, along with four indigenous elders. Looking forward to next quarter, our department will continue to work on the bylaw enforcement SOGs and the records management program I mentioned earlier. We'll also be installing a computer workstation in each of the bylaw vehicles, allowing for full administrative functionality while out in the field. It's an idea we borrowed from the local police. Thank you. <laughs> this will increase efficiency and also visibility in the community, which I think will be a big benefit. Administrative tasks will include further work on the code of conduct and beginning to develop a privacy program, which is another recent requirement from the province. That is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report, Ms. Temple, and to all the great work that you and Corporate Services is delivering on behalf of the District of Souk. No questions? Questions? No questions from me, questions from others. Councillor Bateman. Yeah, thank you. Through you to Ms. Temple. I'm, uh, it's always amazing that, so it's 142 versus 147 bylaw complaints. Is that, historically, is, is that trend pretty consistent or is that an anomaly to see such? No, year over year, we've seen about the same amount with um, a tracking increase. So quarterly, I, I'd have to look back a few years to see if winter, if that tracks for mm -hmm. the past few years, we will we will see more calls as we come through the summer. But year over year, there's there's a gradual increase. So we expect to see that throughout the next quarters. Yeah. And I'm curious about the zoning non-compliance. T tell me, give me some examples of what that might look like. These are generally, um, I'd say the majority of them are people living in trailers or living in tents, um, tends to be one that comes up most often. It could be things like setback requirements, people having structures too close to their setback, et cetera. Councillor Pearson. Yes, through the chair. Um, thank you for the report. And I was looking at the bylaw numbers of tickets that you've entered, and it, there was a category that said bylaw tickets issued. We have 15. Um, then it was the next slide, I think. Uh, parking trailers. 
Is that specifically related to the boat launch? It isn't. No, that's usually related to like unattached trailers that people would tow behind their vehicle left out in the roadways. We've got lots of different categories of parking here, but generally yeah. that's how those would okay. be classified. Okay. And my follow-up question is the boat launch. Are we, are they included in here? Any of the tickets? Because recently we've been issuing tickets there. Uh, my understanding is the boat launch is patrolled by Robbins, so though I don't think that that would um, be included. The most recent tickets, I think, were actually issued by Robbins. Yeah, no, I don't think those would be shown in okay. those 15. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, for the report, as noted. And oh, yes. I just want to say thank you for for the start of these, it's mm -hmm. fascinating to see what's on go, uh, ongoing. And look, I assume they'll be done alphabetically if finance and fire are next. We'll get operations and, That's is that how it's working? No, it's okay. That's exactly. <laughs> I think it's coincidental. And then the in intent would be that this information flows into the annual report and then we would see in the annual report where we're seeing those trend lines where we capture the year and that's i like those too just to see year over year and sort of where we're at because the annual report is public in june but then all of this will flow in but then it gives good intel throughout the year in terms of what's happening uh in this way a bit more brief than yeah exactly go ahead councillor lajeunesse yeah, I just have one quick question. With the Robbins parking agreement, who sets the rates for the parking fines? Is that set by us or is it something that they do? And the reason I'm asking is that um, I had someone come to me and they had received a $200 fine for parking at the in one of the trailer spots at Prestige they were in a rush they didn't get a ticket they figured oh, i'll just pay the fine and it ended up being 200 bucks so uh, they were a little bit disappointed with that so i think there's two things i think the parking is that's our fees and charges by law but in terms of you know we can get clarity on that from staff but in terms of the ticket like then the appropriate piece would then take that back to whomever and have them write in to uh our to corporate services to have that address there. It, this kind of isn't the forum to deal with one-off parking tickets or like traffic tickets or speeding tickets, right? So, and but staff, if you can comment in terms of who, it is our fees bylaw, is it not? Or fees and charges? It, it would be the municipal ticket information bylaw, which sets the fine amounts. Um, but as I'm thinking it through, there is some overlap with Robin's authority. I'd have to look into how exactly that works because I know people who've complained about tickets issued by, issued by Robin's have been referred back to Robin's to go through their dispute process. So I'd, I'd have to just iron that out, but I can email you and email all of council to provide clarity on that. Thank you. Great, hey, thank you. So the recommendation here would be that council receive the corporate services quarterly report for January to March 2023 for information seconded by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving on to 9.2. Uh, so thank you, corporate services. This would be our report. So we're looking at the 2023 community grant applications. Uh, last week, thank you, Council, for the special meeting where you listened and uh, to all of the groups that were coming forward with funding requests. Uh, and then I understand, as this noted here, uh, that deliberations on the outcome would come for tonight and Council to bring back a list of organizations eligible for the restart under the COVID-19 restart funds. Okay, so is there a... I'll hand it over to staff just for an update on where we're sitting. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, so I believe attached to the report should be um, the spreadsheet that uh, detailed potential uh, COVID restart funding grant applications, as well as then just group the remaining grants into um, grants recommended to be funded through the existing uh, 
community grant budget of $65,000. Uh, staff had populated some dollars in there just based on the policy, which gives a $7,000 maximum. Obviously, these are just placeholders and would be open to council's um, interpretation, interpretation or consideration for um, the level of funding you would like to provide to any of these organizations. I uh, don't have much further to add. I believe Ms. Temple has a spreadsheet that she can she has put up on the screen. And similar to prior years, we can just get a running total going as uh, council works through all of these applicants. Okay, Councillor Bateman. Yeah, just the one point I wanted to make was that last year, Amber Academy received a COVID-funded grant. I see they're not on this list of COVID funds. Was that a mistake on our part last year or was it um, just oversight? It might have just been an oversight, I believe. We tried to- For this year, so you For this year, yeah, it was just turning this around really quickly there. Okay. So it probably so was just an Amber oversight. Academy to that side of the ledger, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Beddoes. Yeah, I just need a clarification uh, through you to staff. Um, those ones that even uh, you've got marked down as COVID funding, they still have to meet the criteria of the uh, grants? Uh, correct. I believe staff reviewed um, the applicants and um, determined that the initiatives that they were proposing funding with this would meet the criteria for the grants. Or sorry, for the COVID restart. I don't These, agree with that. So again, it's up to council's interpretation. This was just um, an initial start for a discussion point. Um, obviously, COVID is not a permanent funding source. Um, so it would be up to council if that is the funding option you would choose. I'm just waiting for the the spreadsheet to come back. So just is there and okay. So this is where it's sort of um well, I suppose you could have ambitious and just move the block. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm into that. Uh because okay, because I'm just looking at this here and it's the same. So you we have the funding sources, right, of which are the community grant budget of the $65,000 of what's set aside. Then there's the COVID relief as a secondary funding source. There's council contingency, which is also another source. But we typically look to make sure that all the groups meet the criteria. So that's where, for example, the United Way, because they would then take funds to reallocate like they're not eligible under the policy so they're not listed at all like they've fallen off uh and then there's the cap of the seven thousand. so that's where i see a few have been reduced mm -hmm. to meet in keeping with the policy uh and another so the other one the score clock is a building improvement so that would be Dean School Property, thus Journey Middle, um, African Heritage Association, uh, primary benefit to District of Souk. Um, one is, one's been reduced, United Way has been removed. Royal, Can ha, pardon me, Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue, not located in Souk, but it does provide primary benefit to Souk. And then South Nation is with the 7,000 again. Okay, so that sort of, eliminated some and kept some uh and then am i not mistaken that the take a hike group received funding or they're still in here from elsewhere it's in the works still i'm not 100 they have not formally withdrawn their application at this time okay i think so we are proceeding business as usual until we heard something different but we have not heard that they have withdrawn their request for the donation or for the community grant. Okay. So this could be something if council supports us at this meeting, we find out after the fact that something has changed similar to the policy, then we can advise council that something has changed because it's not like the check will be cut to these people tomorrow kind of thing. So we do have a window of time if something else works out to them and they chose to withdraw their application. 
And that would be one that would come out of COVID restart fund anyway? It, it could. Again, that's it up could. for council's consideration um, if that's the source of funding you would like to use for that. Just thinking that because there's potentially another option there, then that we move that funding to the COVID restart funding. So then if another funder comes to play, then the COVID, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't hurt the grant pool. Like it's what we know should come out of the grant pool. And then this would be COVID restart funds so that if that did come in, then the money would just go back into COVID restart and sit there as opposed to 7,000 sitting in the grant fund. If it's eligible for the COVID relief fund, I would just suggest moving that one over there too. It's currently in. It is in there. Okay. Yes. It is in there. Okay, got it. Right. Because like it says in bold at the top. Wow, Maya. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the rest are through taxes. Okay. So then that leaves 58,000 is in the COVID restart and 60, right? 65 now with Amber, Cad, and me moving over to that block. Okay. Because this is now out of. This is now dated. So if I look at the screen here, then 65,000 in the COVID funds and 57,324 in the COVID grant funds, right? So a little bit different than what's on the screen, but pretty close. Okay, and then that would then leave 7,676, which would then fall into any residual would go into council contingency. I think we've done that in the past. Um, yeah, I believe you have made a resolution to transfer any surplus community grant money into council contingency to have it available in that fund. Otherwise, it would just sit in community grants and not officially be transferred to another budget. Right. But then it disappears at the end of the year because we don't do a second grant Correct. intake. Okay. So given that council has spent a lot of time on this and, and that uh, staff certainly have as well, as well as the organizations, and we're in the middle of April, uh, you know me, I'm just like, okay, let's move the block. Thanks. No, no. Okay, so in that regard, <laughs> well, let's see what happens. So alternate council, what would you like to do? You've all put in a lot more time on this than I have. Do is there a recommendation from somebody? Councillor McMath. Your microphone's on. Oh, sorry. Uh, that council provides sixty-five thousand dollars from the COVID relief fund, and fifty-seven three hundred twenty-four from community grant funding to the applicants as listed in this chart. Something to that effect. I'll second that. So that's been moved by Councillor McMath and seconded by Councillor Bateman. Would you like to speak to your motion, Councillor McMath? Yeah, the ones that were pulled were exactly the ones that I had pulled from my own chart. Um, and I'm happy to move the Amber Academy to the COVID relief fund, especially if those other pieces end up coming back, they'll go to council contingency. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. I would say this is an elegant approach whereby any any anyone has an issue with any of these applicants can now raise them individually. Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to approve this as it is. And now I'll look for members of council should you wish to make an amendment. And that is you're disagreeing with this and you want to pull something or make a shift. Now would be the appropriate time. Councillor Bettos. I disagree with the, the whole process. I mean, I put a lot of hours going through this and uh, fine tuning each one of these and what I thought we should, what would be reasonable for a discussion. And then to come and saying, well, we got lots of money. We just gave everybody everything. I don't think that's what we should be doing. I mean, if if these people that applied and in, in, in earnest uh, deserve it, then they deserve it but we have not had any discussion about it. All we did was listen to them and ask the odd question, but there's some things in here that I would, would not be, a, be in favor of it. And, uh, you know, I had already pulled the United Way, but fortunately staff as well. So uh, I just think the whole exercise, you know, what's the point? I mean, I put a lot of hours going through this, then all of a sudden we're gonna move it as a block because we got the money. I don't care if we got the money. Are, are these people deserving of the money they're asking for? 
And uh, some of them I don't think they are. So now I have to go through my list and look like a, a jerk pulling all these things because I thought we we're going to go through them one at a time. So yeah, that's fine. Poof, way you go. No, that one gets 3,000 instead of 6,000 or whatever and use the justification for it. So I'm just appalled at this process. Just, just doesn't make any sense to me. What's the purpose of what we're doing here? It just annoys me. Anyways. Okay, that's a different different perspective. Thank you. Other members of council. Go ahead, Councillor Pearson. Okay. Um, I would have preferred that the motion broke this in half at that natural line for me, because I think that, it, and, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's, it, it's just the way that they're funded. But um, I wouldn't mind, um, oh, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. You can thinking, do a motion to sever the two as well. well I, it's know, just, I, we're getting the conversation starting here. Yeah, no, no, and, and I appreciate the, the, the motion on the floor. I think there's a lot of people who are very deserving in here. And I think some of them actually are underfunded or asked for lower amounts. And that was kind of what was my concern. There were some, some really good presentations the other night, um, but there was some, there was a lack of presentations. Um, uh, the soup to soup nation uh, didn't, didn't do a presentation for us, but yet um, there's, there's a request for 7,000 and I didn't really understand what the 7,000 was for. Um, and there's, I mean, and there was just a couple that jumped off in the, the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Headquarters. They asked for 5,000. Uh, the Wanda Fuca Marine Society asked only for 3,500. Uh, and I do, and, and the training that they provide there for me was, there's a lot of people coming from elsewhere to get that training, although it, it's a benefit to us. There's three other municipalities that are associated with the with the Wanda Fuca Marine Society, and I don't mind saying it out loud is um, is the Wanda Fuca electoral area, as well as Machosen. Um, and and they their answer to us was they were not getting funding from any of those other municipalities. And I think sometimes you know people come to Souk with with a big ask because you know we we always try to do the right thing and we've always done the right thing with the marine rescue societies and i think machosen and wanda fuca should be participating in that that was just and maybe maybe that's just what i i've got my points already out that there's things in there that we should be saying out loud and getting into the minutes as opposed to just approving the money i think that it's an onerous exercise but i appreciate whatever we'll go to councillor lajeunesse yeah, I just want to point out that uh, in the last meeting, I declared a conflict with the Soup Classical Boating Society. And so I don't know if we can deal with that one separately and I'll slip out for a minute. Yeah, so we could, um, we'll look to do that. I'll go to Councillor McMath and then it would be, thank you for that. Uh, we can pull that one aside once we have a sense of the other one was Councillor St. Pierre, who was is not here, so it's okay. We're oh. Councillor Beddoes did not declare a conflict. Yes, he stepped out. I didn't declare a conflict. He just wanted to speak to it. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I made it quite clear that I was not in a conflict, but just that my wife was making the presentation and I didn't think it looked very good if I was in the room when she made the presentation. So I left the room. But you don't feel you're in conflict? Oh, absolutely no conflict. Okay, there. that's fine. It's up to the individual, so, okay. Uh, okay, so, Councillor McMath. Um, so we all spent hours on this. Um, and this is the opportunity for you, rather than, I understand you have like your feelings, but, this is your opportunity to articulate what you would change in the process and why you're going to vote for or against. The other reality is that all of these community groups have suffered like the rest of this community with the challenges over the last three years. And to the other point that Souk is the only contributor right now, um, you brought up great points to push back to them. And so they will go to those groups. And now that Souk has set a precedent it will put the pressure on those other municipalities to chip in as well. So it's great to be a leader that way. We do have the funding and those groups fall under the, the COVID requirements as well as our community grant process. 
so in the in the essence of being efficient, that is why I have moved this as a bulk. Okay, thank you. So what I would look for then is a, an amendment, and that would be that the yeah, uh, I don't know where is it here that the classic where is it? I just want to get the name right. The, the classical boating society be the amendment be be um, removed from the block for individual consideration. Okay, uh, Councillor, who can move that? Councillor McMath can move the amendment and seconded by Councillor Pearson. Thank you. So we're doing that. It would just be weird if you moved it because you're in conflict. Okay, so I'll call the question on the amendment, please. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. So now we're on the amended motion. So of which there would be two. It would be the, the applications in the block. And then the second one would be for the classic boating society. So why don't we, is there other comments on the main motion, main amended motion? Okay, so I will call the question on the main amended motion first, and that would be all of the other ones. I, I think we're clear on what we're doing. Okay, all those in favor, please. Any opposed? Councillor Beddoes is opposed, the motion carries. Now, Councillor Lajeunesse, can you exit and we'll deal with this one. And that would be that council fund the suit classical voting society in the amount of 5,500. Moved so by moved. Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Councillor Lajeunesse is out of the room, so he's maintaining his conflict. All those in favor, please. That's unanimous, thank you. Okay, can we have Councillor Lajeunesse return to the room? I might've said Councillor Bateman. Did I say Councillor Bateman has left the room? Okay, no, sorry, okay. I could. <laughs> no, that's fine. We... Okay, well, that's a good one. So how about we call a recess? It is, oh, sorry. Did you want to make a resolution uh, with what to do with the remaining 7,676? Okay, let's do that. Uh, so then council directs staff to put the remaining amount of 7,500, $676 uh, into council contingency. Moved by Councillor McMath, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any questions or comments? See none, all in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Beddoes is opposed. No, no. Okay, Councillor Be Beddoes is in favor. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so we're right on eight o'clock and we will take a recess until 8 10. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are at time for 810. So we're going to kick off with item 10.1 under bylaws. And this is our five year financial plan. And so I'll turn this back over to staff, please. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Don't have a formal presentation to go along with this as this bylaw is just up for adoption, but just wanted to highlight the attachment um, added onto this report in regards to the public engagement open house uh, feedback. Um, so that was just provided similar to um, a resident's comment earlier is um, some of the lessons learned and that we're going to reflect on before we start um, planning for next year's public engagement would be um, the timing and where and when to have this, um, you know, we could do it on the weekend. We do, I guess that's what we're debating because throughout the year, we're trying to engage and be out at community markets on the weekends and other times have the citizen budget survey during the summer available, which is where we're really trying to gather the community input um, on, on aspects um, to be included in the next year's budget. Uh, and the open house is really supposed to be uh, just an opportunity for the community to attend and learn uh, what our initiatives are for the year and, um, you know, and have staff available at another resource, have them all in a room to ask questions. So it's definitely something that we'll probably include in a survey question this year, um, just asking for the timing of what would help um, more participants come. I mean, when adjacent municipalities are having protests, I will take that as a victory personally, but um, obviously attendance would be better. We have all staff here available for, for that whole time frame. So, um, you know, we're trying to do what we can to encourage people to come out at the end of the day. Um, you know, we're kind of limited in how much we can do, but we'll definitely be looking at um, other options and other information to include that will provide a more valuable uh, experience for residents. And I will just leave it at that. Like I said, I'll answer any further questions if needed. Okay, uh, questions, maybe I'm I'm going to put Ms. Royal, Royal Collard on the spot, given that you were at Sukarama for the day on Saturday. Was there anything new or different that you may have heard from members of the public while you were there on the Saturday? I know it was really busy, enjoyed by many. Hello. <laughs> um, I would say that at least half of the people that came to visit me at the booth were interested and curious to the tax breakdown as to what was municipal and what was externally, uh, what external agencies were. So I think that it was a good opportunity for me to educate residents on that part, but no one was upset or angry and everyone seemed really happy. And then were the rest just sort of general qu queries about district operations? Yeah, more, um, like a pothole on their road, the street lights, um, when are we getting sidewalks? What are the new projects that are going on in the community? And we had the transportation master plan and the parks and trails master plan there. So we were able to provide that information to them. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot, but it would just be helpful given that we received from Intel about, um, you know, we're trying different things, uh, you know, trying the Sukarama Sea Park, different location, different type of venue, the country markets. We've had our municipal Monday days, which have ranged from many people. And then we've located in Broomhill Park uh, with the intention of reaching families, um, but didn't really because it wasn't, it rained that day. So I don't know if that put people off, start a spring break, I believe as well. So we thought we might attract more families, but people are still working. So it's always an ongoing uh, but I think that our staff and, and members of council have been really trying to do a lot to do to be present. So from the night markets to the country markets. So we're hitting Saturday and Thursday nights, as well as uh, in the past, which I know is scheduled to return this year is a larger event, October event in the community hall all day where there's the departmental boost, more movement, more space, more ability to move around. Uh, so that was also popular, uh, as well as just the ongoing conversation. You all have a presence in the community and are engaging with residents, and many of us live here and are are talking uh, about it. So, yeah, but I am rather, I do know that when items are important, residents do take the time to come speak to us as we have. 
and email and reach out through many other messages. Um, and uh, the, yeah, and I've received very few queries about it, a lot of queries on many other matters. Um, maybe Councillor Bateman, would you like to comment? I mean, you put a very descriptive blog together on Facebook, which I have the ability to then not have to redo it. I just yeah. can share yours uh, or retweet messages to try to help uh, spark a conversation. But it just seems the feedback that I've received is that's great information. I know where it's going. Thank you. Yeah. So for me, the anecdotal feedback I've heard is that uh, the people I've spoken with are very pleased that we're moving forward so positively with police and fire, getting up to 24 seven coverage. And um, I did do, I try, I searched social media. I don't spend a lot of time on the suit groups anymore, but uh, I didn't see much about the taxes. I'm looking over at Mr. Anderson who moderates the suit issues page. I, I didn't see much on there. Was there a fair bit? No. no. Okay. <laughs> and um, my one comment would be the, the, the budget video, which you did the last couple of years. I noted the last year's had 266 views. I don't know how long, obviously a lot of time, is, staff time is spent preparing that, but it's a pretty useful tool. It's, going ahead. it's definitely something we can look at for doing uh, for 2024's budget. We were just even though the budget's later, it was a bit of a crunch to get everything done at the end of the day. So um, as you said, it would definitely be a bunch of staff time, but um, that is a way to get our views up for sure. So I think it's something we can explore for 2024 is when we have a bit more time. Yeah. And and as Mrs. Lures said, and as you say in your staff report, a weekend might be, might be more effective. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, but then you have an all, maybe you have an all candidates event. You expect a theater to be packed in leading up to a municipal election, beautiful day, half empty theater. This is one chance to hear candidates. So like we're doing our best. And sometimes, you know, when you ask, uh, some are like, oh, we can see where that there's work being done and we're happy and it's fine. There isn't really always a need to come forward. I don't know. It, it is what it is. We keep doing our best to reach out and it is what it is. Okay, Councillor Beddows. Yeah, I was at Sukarama and uh, I sort of kept an eye on, on our booth. I was over there with the Lions a few times too. Uh, I spent quite a few calls on, on taxes, people just coming up to me. Most were positive. I had two complain bitterly about the taxes, but they wouldn't be happy with anything. So, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, most people are very concerned about the policing. Uh, there, I have a few complaints in regards to uh, some street people. I had a very lengthy talk in regards to how the food bank is, uh, since our building is being uh, populated on charters, that uh, the food bank is uh, getting uh, many, many applications. And uh, the original, what the comment was saying, these people are coming to Victoria and they're, they're being housed there. So I didn't know what to say about that. I saying, well, you know, anybody can come from any part of the region and, and live in our community. We, we don't have a closed door policy. So those are the calls. Uh, the concerning calls were the, the safety on the streets. Uh, very happy that we're hiring more RCMP officers. Uh, they seem to even understand about the, the fire department, which I'm hoping our fire chief is gonna come and talk to the Lions and explain <laughs> the advantages of having 24 seven uh, uh, but not a whole lot on taxes. Like I say, the two people that complained about the taxes, I'm sure they wouldn't be happy with them anyway. So. so in terms of concerns around policing, they're glad to see that we're addressing that through increasing the complement. Absolutely. The absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Okay. And there is a big concern in regards to uh, some of these buildings and uh, the local infrastructure like the food bank and uh, all these others that will have to look after these people. I mean, all of us. So uh, yeah, interesting times. And those are comments that I think could be heard throughout every municipality in BC and across the country, right? They're not just unique to Souk specifically. So we're doing our best here. Okay. All right. So we have um, two recommendations that I believe can be read together. Or do you like them? They're one and two, they're separate. 
Yes, okay. please. Very clear. First off, that council received the 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan report for information. Moved by Councillor McMath, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. The next one is that council adopt the bylaw cited as 2023 to 2027 financial plan bylaw number 881-2023. Moved by Councillor McMath, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any questions? Final say on budget. Anything for anyone? Councillor McMath, you moved it. Councillor Lajeunesse, no. Councillor Bateman. Just a comment. And uh, as much as people did, we only had 22 at this open house, the material on the Let's Talk Souk budget page, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. I always look back to five years ago when we had nothing but that thicket of figures and columns, right? And here we are five years later with remarkable, I, I really advise people to check out this this new five-year financial plan because it's it's an explainer. It's full of educational material. And the um, if you go to the Let's Talk suit page, you can click on the, uh, the um, what were they called? The boards, Story right? Boards. Storyboards. And those are remarkable. Yeah. So anyone out there, I know there's two or three of you, <laughs> have a look. And I've also noted that the, because we're with the adjusted assessed value that sort of we were looking at $100 more in taxes a year has dropped to $75 for average assessed values. Correct. I can okay. speak to that a bit at the night. I think that's fair. And that 1% in taxes still only generates around $100,000? Correct. It, it's closer to $100,000 now. I think it was like 93000 something last year. Now it's 98000 and something. So I round up to $100,000. Okay. Other comments from members of council? Okay, well, I just wish to thank all of you, including our acting base commander that is here, Fire Chief, for working together and finding a ways not only to improve and enhance service levels, but to pursue the grants that we need, the infrastructures for plant planning pieces, for all of that work, and also council for for taking part in this through the workshops and through the other learning opportunities and for messaging out in all our unique ways to members of the community in terms of what's happening. So well done, everybody. I'll call the question all in favor. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so we're done with the budget for a few months. <laughs> anyway, and then we'll get started. I think the tax rate bylaws next. Yes. Item 10.2. Okay, over to staff, please. Uh, thank you. I don't have a formal presentation to go along with this. Um, just wanted to highlight, as um, Mayor Tate stated, that um, with the uh, revised role we received from BC Assessment, the non-market change revenue adjusted from $180,000-ish to just over $300,000. I don't know why I've heard some other municipalities complain about this big swing. Normally it doesn't swing that much. So I, I'm not sure what happened at BC assessment, but we, they completed the, or sorry, this revised role is the final number. So those are the numbers we're going with. Um, those are the numbers that the tax taxes will be billed out on. So the bonus to that is there's more non-market change revenue, which comes from uh, new properties added to soup during the year. So that has reduced the uh, tax impact to $74 and 62 cents for the average assessed property. So that, um, that will mean the uh, average residential property is now assessed at $805,722, an increase of 10.62% over uh, last year. Um, yeah, and so of course there's a complicated calculation where that doesn't mean that your taxes are going up 10%. Um, there's the BC assessment has a good um, video graphic and some other information on their site for people that have further questions. Um, staff just uh, before this meeting finished um, compiling the municipal and um, third or third party collections spreadsheets and summary. So we'll provide that information to council in case you get these questions as well. That will be added to our list. Let's Talk Souk website. And um, 
distributed to the front end staff so that when the questions come as the property tax notices get mailed out later in May, um, they'll have this information handy. So stay tuned to your emails for clearly updated spreadsheets for your information. And just again, to highlight um, what Mayor Tate said, just really wanted to thank the team for um, coming together and uh, responding to the survey results, the needs of the community and every department really worked hard to come up with some priorities that we could actually try and accomplish this year, um, knowing that this was a tight year and um, appreciate council's consideration with the 24 seven change for RCMP and fire. That is a huge um, decision council made and I've fully respect and support that and staff are, are appreciative of the clarity provided for those two critical departments. And now we know the, the pieces to uh, in, in, or incorporate into the budget moving forward in the out year. So we'll report out on that each year as part of the budget cycle of the funding sources for these options. And um, yeah, just really looking forward to in June, starting the next round of 2024 budget planning. Excellent, thank you. Questions for Ms. Gray. So in terms of RCMP, um, now that this is adopted, then we can give notification and begin that process. Uh, correct. There's a letter that goes out that just informs that um, you know, it's a year out. So it will just advise the RCMP that the council is supportive of hiring two positions in 2024. So they'll get their recruitment process started and we'll be budgeting for that in 2024. And um, that will be the next first, the next step in this. And then for any anyone here interested or those viewing, it's also the case where well we're absorbing the unionization pieces, um, doing that over the two year, which we're allowed to from the federal government. We are aware of the ecom and the nine one one, and we're planning for that as well as challenges with growth. So just while you know we are aware of cost pressures that are continuing to come our way, and we're in in good communication there. Um, also hearing that um, to that we may see a summer like 21 uh, where it's extremely hot and dry. So right away that flags a concern of wildfire uh, within our community. So glad to see some for extra 24 seven coverage because wildfires don't care what time of the day it is. They just break out and we need to respond and, and take care of our residents accordingly and our properties and places of value. So it's just it's planning for all of that and it's just that's what we're hearing is coming is that this long that it's going to be another extreme summer so maybe they'll be wrong but no. some smart people get it right councillor bateman i had i just had a, a question vis-a-vis -vis, uh business uh, not necessarily the mill rate but i'm, I'm just curious in our five-year financial plan we always refer to the average assessed residential property so I'm I'm curious in terms of our business tax rates, uh, how is that uh, year to year? Can you give us some sense? Uh, just bear with me for one second. Sorry, the question like in regards to well, we know that we're, we're, we're increasing residential taxes here by mm -hmm. 6.99 percent. I'm curious what percentage is at play in terms of uh, business commercial. Um, so business, um, so just get complicated. Technically, I'm sure due does. to the non-market change revenue change, uh, the residential portion of taxes has gone up 5.65 percent. Um, okay. to make it to the $75. So even though the overall budget increase is 6.99. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, because we didn't go back and rechange the whole budget for that, I guess, to clarify that. So the, the portion coming from um, existing residents is 5.65. And then the business portion of that um, taxes have gone up for the average, um, based on the average assessed value, $175. For the year, which is um, just uh, under four percent, so it's a it's a complicated dance we do between all of these lines, um, and it's it's hard to get it exactly equal. Sure. Um, so it's just an averaging thing um, based on we're still receiving eighty four percent of our taxes from residents and fourteen percent from businesses. 
and then the remaining few percentages sprinkled through the other classes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. 5.65%. Gets better each time. Okay. Anyway, uh, it it is what it is. Which is why we try and focus on the dollars, not the percentage, because it's 1% yeah. is $100,000, but somebody else 1% is a million dollars. So um, the dollars are really what the focus, what we try to focus. Yeah. Okay. So the recommendation is that council give first, second, and third reading to the bylaws cited as property tax rate bylaw number 883-2023. It's moved by Councillor McMath and seconded by Councillor Pearson. Any comments on the readings, Councillor McMath? Councillor Pearson, anything from anyone else? See none, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Next up is 10.3, bylaw number 882, building bylaw amendments, please. Thank you. Uh, this item is before council to address uh, two proposed amendments to the uh, building bylaw. And uh, the first one is related to secondary suites. Uh, this is before council because there's been conversation with the uh, with a representative from the local builders association here in Souk just regarding the definition of secondary suites. The current definition in the building bylaw is taken from the uh, BC building code. And the conversation was regarding the uh, minimum one hour fire resistance rating in that definition. Um, there's other sections of the BC building code that speak to fire ratings less than one hour. So it was creating a bit of a, some, some confusion um, in this instance. So staff are of the, of the opinion that if it helped with the interpretation um, uh, for applicants to remove the one hour component, and speak to the definition in general terms. And, and that's the only portion that's been proposed to be changed in our definition, and it's bolded in our report. Um, the BC Building Code still um, takes authority on what the fire rating requirements are. This is just merely to take this conversational confusion piece out of the mix and direct this right back to the building code. And so based on each project specific requirements, um, the applicant will determine what is required for fire rating and our building officials will determine if that's code compliant. So we felt this was a, a reasonable um, amendment to propose to the suites. The second amendment is specifically regarding the double permit fee that gets assessed when construction begins without a permit. As it's presently uh, written within our building bylaw, the director of planning and development has the sole discretion to uh, apply that fee. It's uh, been noted to us that it's it's proper wording that the fee be administered um, impartially. Uh, and so in this instance, it's a straight, the fee will be assessed. If it's been determined by the building official that there is construction without a building permit, they will be assessed. And taken from the Municipal Insurance Association's model template, there's also the inclusion of the maximum of up to $10,000. For that double fee. Um, so I believe to date with our any double fees that have been charged, we haven't uh, exceeded that 10,000 limit. Um, typically, if it's a, you know, a $2,500 building fee, 5,000 was, was the maximum on that. So this addresses it from a legal standpoint to be more consistent that there is no sole discretion by the director. It is merely construction without a permit, double fee is assessed. So based on those two proposed amendments, um, staff are in support of proceeding with first, second, and third reading um, of the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paolo. Um, given that the province has now indicated that all dwellings, all single family units in BC are legally able to have a secondary suite of which we've already, we're, we already have at play. I'm just wondering about communication. Like, yes, you can have that suite, but you still need a building permit. And I think that's where there's some language in there that it, the suite has to meet code. I think there was something about forgivable loans provided. Um, for, forgivable loans, if you rent for five, if you can prove five years of below market rent, but the suite still has to meet code. I thought I read that. So I'm just wondering, um, just if we have a way of communicating that, yes, uh, you are, you have been able to do this, you know, you register the suite, there is the lift, the secondary lift charge, 
for wastewater, but they still need to meet code um, just so we don't have residents in unsafe situations. I don't know how, like if, if we need to do that or if I'm thinking about a problem that may not come to be, but uh, it's not new to us to allow secondary suites and dwellings. That's always, that's been the case for quite some time. It wasn't always, it used to be 500 meters, square meters or greater, and then it reduced to, I think 300 square meters. And then I think that's our minimum size. So it was pretty much all units. Yes, I think sometimes there's confusion between the zoning bylaw and the building bylaw when it comes to secondary suites. So with with our, our building bylaw, we are open to allowing whatever's uh, permitted through the building code, which has certainly been been opened up quite a bit now to to address housing and, and the needs within each community throughout the province. It's our zoning bylaw, and that's no different than in other municipalities where certain restrictions are put on where you can have secondary suites, the size of the suites, how many you can have on the property. So as we go through the official community plan process, um, it's staff's intent that once the official community plan has been adopted, the next major project for us will be a comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw, and we will get into more in-depth conversations regarding zoning um, for secondary suites, as you mentioned, we currently allow it in all of our low density residential zones, but there's also the piece about duplexes and townhouses and will we allow for secondary suites um, in those types of residential dwelling units as well. So we, we will do a very much comprehensive review of secondary suites and, and bring it up to today's standards with public acceptance. And then that'll be through the zoning bylaw, because then there's covenants on properties where there's restrictive, like restrictive covenants are on properties where they prohibit suites. And then also there's building schemes in some cases as well that may allow or may prohibit. That, that is correct. Yeah. Through through previous, uh, it may have been through a subdivision or a zoning process. Um, the applicant at that time may have registered covenants restricting um, whether secondary suites may or may not be allowed and perhaps sizes as well. So that is something that can also be looked at as well. We're able to entertain if somebody wishes to come forward in future to remove that covenant to go through that application process as well. Okay, because that would have been put in play in the past to deal with part, things like parking when different things came forward, right? So it'll just be interesting to see what occurs there. Okay, thank you. Questions, Councillor Pearson? Yeah, and I, yeah. Through the chair to you, and it's just a comment. And I think that uh, the way I read that with the province is that they're allowing secondary suites in all zones, not just areas. So it uh, the, their wording was 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 quite specific on all zones are going to allow secondary suites, which I think think is kind of interesting when we start like all zones and I think because I mean you're 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 talking about some you know townhouses and things like that that are that are in in those zones, so. Can, I guess more stay tuned for that. Um, my question is around the building permit fees, double for every permit application. Construction is commenced. I kind of worry about that. And I, I could, because I didn't, I'm trying to see where the old 17 was. Because I know that there's been within the last, or since I've been elected, somebody elected to pay double permit fees as a result of trying to get started. So I know this is our way of doing it. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm thinking that, is there an opportunity for somebody to um, appeal that decision? This is like, this is making an air tight, right? The way I see it. That's correct. And that's the way that it was previously before we did our building bylaw. Yeah. Uh, update it was very similar wording to this with minus the the maximum uh amount but that existed previously in our old building bylaw and, and continues on with this as well as the model template from municipal insurance association it's recognition that somebody has gone ahead and done something um and that is the penalty that's being assessed without proper approvals so and and of course i'm going to ask the question what is construction where does it start Sorry, could you repeat that last? So, so application, if construction commenced before the building official issued a permit. So when we're, when we're saying that, what is, what's our definition of construction? 
Is it pouring concrete or is it building the forms? Is it excavating? Where does it start and stop? So typically it's once that foundation is being poured, um, now construction has commenced where you would need a issued permit to confirm that that foundation is code compliant. And, and, I, and I understand that. So what about, what about um, if you've got a CD zone and you're putting in a number of bases, you're excavating, you're doing all things, but you, you still don't have your site plan. So how does that, like, you know, because we're getting into some, and, and I'm only asking these questions for clarity because it has come up within the last three or four months. So if somebody digs a hole, puts the wood down, but doesn't pour the concrete, they're not subject to double fines. No, essentially what somebody would be doing is they're they're commencing work on the site at their own risk that should the time come that a building permit is issued and whatever work they've done prior to issuance, they might have to now remedy that. So it's a, it's a cost to them for now, perhaps moving earth a little bit more, or if they right. put rebar in, now they've essentially rendered that rebar useless and now they have to acquire more materials. Right. But once that foundation is in, that's typically an indication that that foundation okay. is likely not going to be moved. Um, or if it is, that's going to be significantly costly in addition to being assessed the double permit penalty. Okay. Thank you. Councillor McMath? Uh, how often is this happening? How often is this happening? Mm -hmm. uh, not often. It might happen um, once a year, I've been made aware of. Um, in other instances, we, we typically can catch it before it progresses too far. Um, but yeah, like I said, once once a year is probably what I've experienced. And when you connect with those people, what is the reasoning behind them going ahead with that? Uh, sometimes, that, well, given the, the market and what their scheduling is for materials and, and their contractors, they've said, uh, you know, we had people lined up. We, we took a gamble. We thought uh, we would be ready to go and have an issued permit, but we weren't code compliant in one area. And so that was the gamble and, and, and they lost on that gamble okay. and, and they acknowledge that. Thank you. Sometimes Councillor McMath, there's a case where there's an existing home and someone's making improvements within the home, maybe separating or creating a suite for another family member and thinking because we're not changing the footprint of the home and we're doing changes within our residence and its family, we don't need a permit. And in which case they're alerted to us because passer buyers or there's been complaints received from others and that's how we receive notification of it. I was curious if it was coming from a delay in the permit process and they just decided to to move on. There's been some that have said um, we're we're confident with our engineering architectural so we're we're going to pay the fees and get on. So that's happened as well. Okay, so Question, <laughs> Councillor Beeman? Yeah, I, I just uh, threw you to, to staff. Um, so as you know, and can, I've shared with Council as well, and with you, Mr. Palau, uh, some correspondence from a developer who's who's got the zoning, is ready to break ground, and he is pointing to uh, an amendment to the BC Building Code for secondary suites uh, passed in November 2018, which eliminated... Um, the uh, floor space amounts for secondary suites. So what if I have interpreted what you've said earlier is that this is a zoning bylaw matter. And as much as the BC building code supersedes our building code, in this case, uh, we'll have to wait for the zoning bylaw amendment to consider this. That is correct, though those regulations are contained within our zoning bylaws. By so like many other municipalities that have similar restrictions, um, they will be examining um, how they could perhaps provide more housing opportunity by making changes that are more in line with the BC Building Code. Okay, so the recommendation is that Council give first, second, and third reading of the bylaw cited as building amendment bylaw number 882-780-02-2023. Moved by Councillor McMath, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any comments, Councillor McMath, Lajeunesse? Anything from anyone else? Seeing none, all in favor, please. And you, none opposed, that's unanimous, thank you. 
Okay, there is no new business to my knowledge because we're doing the rise and report after council verbal reports. So that brings us to correspondence requiring action. We have one here that's been pulled from Councillor Bateman. Yeah. So thank you. I, I pulled this because it was such a, a well-written, reasoned um, uh, letter from from Mr. Um, Marsden, a local builder, who uh, wrote it to uh, the, the Minister of Housing with a CC to Mayor and Council. And I noted, um, if I can find my paperwork here. I'm sorry. Um, right, it, a very substantial submission uh, seeking to get a revision to the Local Government Act, and that in relation to um, Section 511, which relates to uh, subdivisions of land within a municipality, uh, when when a bylaw is changed, then there is a year's grace period before that bylaw's impact is felt on a, an approved subdivision. And he's noting, Mr. Marson is in his uh, letter here, that this does not apply to development permits. And as such, I just wanted to start the conversation. This is out of my league, you know, but it's something I'd be curious to know what staff think about this uh, this suggestion from Mr. Marsden. Um, we have this newly revitalized Soup Builders Association, which is seeking to uh, to liaise with council and with staff. I'm, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on this at this point. I, I've had many conversations uh, over the last few years with Mr. Marsden about uh, our bylaws, provincial legislation, and I think um, he articulates his position quite well. Um, in this instance, I I would happen to agree with Mr. Marsden. I think there's opportunity to explore how more certainty within the development permit application process can be provided to applicants. Um, I'd be curious to know what other municipalities think of this position, as well as what the provincial government feels would be an appropriate amendment in the Local Government Act. More globally regarding the Local Government Act, I, I do have concerns and they've been expressed by by other um, planning departments and other jurisdictions is that there is quite a bit of discretion within the act. A, a lot of terminology is not defined. It's really left up to each municipality to provide their own interpretation. And I find from that each municipality may interpret the legislation differently, which causes confusion uh, for the development community. So if the province could possibly step forward and provide more clarity that might give Mr. Marsden and others uh, a better comfort level in proceeding, knowing that their bylaws uh, would have a certain grace period. Certainly when it comes to development cost charges, there is a 12 month grace period. And as he had mentioned, subdivisions uh, are afforded that opportunity. Development permit applications do not have that. Um, so I think, I think it would be a, a good conversation to continue on amongst other municipalities if they see this as being a possible solution. I'm sure the developers would share his, his opinion on this, and I would certainly um, welcome an op opportunity to further that conversation. I know um, Alberta went through a, uh, a modernization of their Local Government Act uh, a couple years ago. I know Ontario was looking at their Planning Act last year and making changes. So given the situation, um, housing being a, a significant need, a, a lot of provinces are looking at opportunities and, and this would be potentially one of them. That note, um, hearing your, your affirmation of Mr. Morrison's um, views and opinions, I'd like to move the council consider uh, council write a letter in support of Mr. Marsden's uh, correspondence to the Minister of Housing. Um, asking that the BC government um, consider a legislative amendment. I haven't sent this through to you, Ms. Temple, so my apologies. 
um, to consider a legislative amendment to section 511 of the Local Government Act to offer protection for development permit and subdivision applications. For Mr. Marzen has suggested 24 months. Um, I haven't asked you about that time frame and whether you feel that that is appropriate. But the key point here would be that this motion would uh, bring the uh, the matter forward to the minister's attention what, for a second time and let them know that Souk is um, would be considering this. Okay, so it'd be right. <clears throat> yes. On uh, yeah, the minister of housing. Uh, I just looked at the blank there. Consider. So just wait till it's on the screen yeah. here. The council read a letter to honor to the honorable Ravi Kalon, minister of housing, to consider an amendment to the local government act to consider protection for development permit applications from twelve months to twenty four months. It looks like it was 12 months in the currently. No, there's no protection whatsoever. Oh, there's no protection whatsoever. To consider protection for development permits for two years. Can I try and rewrite that? So to consider. Okay, just turn on your microphone. Consider a legislative amendment to section 511. to section 511 of the Local Government Act with regards, I think, with regards to development permit applications. Both yeah. Okay. With regards to both subdivision and development permit applications. And I think it'd be worthwhile to also note as, as discussed in the, in the letter dated March 22nd, 2023 from uh, Patrick Marston. And that's March 20, 22nd. And I can motivate a little bit. Do you wanna just uh, get, confirm you're satisfied yeah, okay. with the writing and then we'll get a seconder? That's good. Okay, do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Pearson. Go ahead, Councillor. So I'll Pearson. motivate and just the fellow use the word certainty. And at the BC at the housing summit in Vancouver the other week, that that, that word was repeated again and again. Um, there is um, with builders and the construction industry in these challenging times. Um, as they move forward with projects, often years in the planning and execution. And this, there was a quote I, I captured from Chris Atchison, president of the BC Construction Association, stating local governments must provide clear, open, predictable processes um, for um, as, as contractors go into local communities. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. I will echo a lot of the statements by my fellow councillor Bateman. Uh, I attended at the AVICC Attainable Housing Inspiration uh, for, for Coastal Communities, well, that was put on by the province. And again, it's all in this making it predictable so that, that people can plan and, and move forward with the project without having to regroup. Because regrouping costs a lot of time and a lot of money. And the time is just as important because the housing stock um, needs to be increased in, in British Columbia by 178,000 or something like that every year from now till 2050 or so. Okay, other comments from members of council? Go ahead. Yeah, I would agree with all of what's been said and, and um, I don't need to repeat what Mr. Marston says in his letter. I just think that uh, mid-game rule changes are not uh, good for anyone, especially when they've secured their financing and 
um, are ready to to get moving. There's enough delays as, as is, and to have rule changes in the middle of the process is not not fair. I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Do you mean like approved development permits, or these are? Yes, those are approved. Like approved development permits. Like I can, as opposed, like these say applications. So I just want to clarify that someone has an approval. Uh, like an approved development permit that they have protection for two years. Or, right? Or subdivision that's been approved that um, they have protection for two years for, for it. But then this is application. So that's where I'm just. The original letter is application. Talks about application. Next, uh, can we okay yes miss temple i have section 511 of the local government act up on my screen sorry i can't save it but it actually uh is once an application has been submitted and the applicable fee has been paid that's when the protection starts to kick in it's not once issued mr paolo yeah, so just to, to further clarify that, what happens is somebody submits an application and partway through the review process of the development permit, a new official community plan is adopted or some other applicable bylaw is changed. And now their application that they initiated, they've now got to spend more time or money making changes to now apply the new bylaw requirements. What Mr. Marsden is seeking is similar to the subdivision uh, application process that uh, Ms. Temple just read out is that Development permit application is submitted. Uh, a grace period of, of whatever number of months is allowed so that those bi old bylaws are still applicable and they don't have to make changes to their application. Once it once that time period lapses, then they would have to come into conformity with whatever the new bylaw requirements are if they haven't had approval yet. Okay, got it. And then to clarify, right now though, development if someone has an approved development permit then it's in place for two years and then they can apply to have it extended for two years or something or a year or something they have to um commence an enactment of the development permit conditions um, within those two years or else the development permit is void so typically that means they need to submit a building permit within uh, that time period because then that building permit would enact whatever development the, the development permit was approving Right, it it falls off if there if it goes inactive, where zoning stays in Correct. perpetuity. Okay, got it. Do you have any concerns with this? No, I I think my my original comment stands. Is I I think it, it's worthwhile to have further conversation amongst other municipalities to flush out time frames, any other um, matters that haven't been discussed yet that might have implications on municipalities. Obviously. The biggest piece that stands out, and we have to weigh the pros and cons, is that there's a community vision that has now been accepted uh, through the adoption process of, uh, we'll say, an official community plan. The public may be expecting that all new developments are falling under that vision, but we now have this uh, period of time where uh, in-stream applications for development permits are following another bylaw. And so how do we reconcile that with public expectation versus legislative uh, allowances? So that's where I think that that conversation should still continue, whether it's amongst uh, AVIC or UBCM or, or however the, the message is further communicated. I agree with Mr. Marzen's comments in principle. It's just flushing out a time period that is appropriate and tying up any concerns that might have implications on the public and, and the municipality if we were to go down that route. Okay, but in this case, we're not going to be doing that. We're just going to be writing a letter uh, and to bring this forward, okay. Yeah, I, I'm just suggesting if if we wish to provide further clarity to gain provincial support for these changes, if we can develop that uh, that structure of exactly what we'd like to see the legislative changes um, hold, um, more discussion might be appropriate to achieve that. Otherwise, I, th I think this is just a, a, a high level conversation of support for seeing some form of change and putting it in the province's hands. 
I guess, I guess we can decide whether we want the province to, to lead this or if we want to provide more input after discussing it with our other municipalities. Seems to me that they're just going to plow ahead and uh, they're indicating that they're drafting the legislation and they're going to table it in the fall and that's that. And uh, so I think this is, there's little opportunity for them to consult or engage further. I think they have their plan and they're moving ahead with it. Unfortunately, we were the ones that build community. Anyway, go ahead, Councillor Pearson. And this really points to the inequity in in the two different processes. That's that's the point of Mr. Marsden's letter. Is that it's different rules for for uh, a townhouse development permit. And the minister should the minister should be addressing that. Um, All good. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Oh, Ms. Temple. Just a tiny question. Did you want staff to write that letter? We didn't include that in the resolution. Yes, council directs staff. We'll draft something up. We'll work on it together. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that friendly amendment. Okay. I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some council verbal reports. Councillor Pearson. My microphone on and away I go. Um, okay. I went to ABICC last weekend. Um, there were some highlights for me. Uh, John Jack uh, spoke on, on Sunday morning very inspirational uh, talk around reconciliation. Reconciliation was his term. Um, the over, uh, you know, attended all of the resolution meetings. There was, there was lots of resolutions. It was interesting to hear again from all of the communities on Vancouver Island. I attain, I went to the attainable housing inspiration uh, for Vancouver Island coastal communities. And it was, Souk was highlighted. And I didn't know that it was gonna be in there around our gathering place. And uh, we got huge kudos uh, from um, Kayla Wiseman, Kayla Wiseman, who's uh, in, uh, looking after the funding, about Souk being one of the communities that was ready with Lot A, the property, donating that and making it all work. So they were excited to be working with us. And she said she will, her words were, I will be getting the money this year. So that was, that was kind of nice. Um, I also toured the Nanaimo Pollution Control Center, or what other people call the sewer plant. Oh, so, <laughs> uh, that was that was really good. Um, and then uh, on Saturday, I went to the uh, Sukarama at the end of the day and seemed to be well attended. Saw our booth and uh, thank um, Miss Royer Collard for employing me at the end of the day to carry the equipment out to the, her car. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Bateman. So uh, I too was at Sukarama. Congratulations to Godfrey Medhurst and the Lions for pulling that one off. Uh, the Capstone EMCS grade 12 project presentations were fascinating and bright young things heading out into the world. Um, I attended the Earth Day at the Country Market on Saturday. Um, I spent some time at the district's booth chatting with the volunteers from Royal Roads is um, environmental science program played a game of Plinko as Christina Mogg tells us it's called and won myself a Souk 2030 branded water bottle it was a nice bit of swag. Uh, BC Rental Bank was the focus of a discussion of the latest age friendly committee meeting and this rental bank very interesting is a program where where individuals in crisis and are just you know days away from being evicted can apply for uh, up to $3,000 in funding through the Community Social Planning Council of Greater Victoria which administers this um, rent bank. Souk Homelessness Coalition had a meeting. We're finalizing the terms of reference for a, a community advisory team. And on that terms of reference, we've identified um, 19 potential members, including 
RCMP, Souk bylaw, uh, and District of Souk Council. So I know there's a number of individuals on. I'm going to uh, step into it through the Homeless Coalition. However, we'll be coming to Council seeking uh, one of you or perhaps more because we have Councillor Beddoes, Councillor St. Pierre, Councillor Lajeunesse. You made sent a very interesting email the other day. Um, so th this community advisory team is is there to be an interface between the homeless in Souk and the Souk Shelter Society and businesses, citizens, all of these um, groups that are uh, directly engaged in working on this incredibly challenging and complicated issue. And finally, I'll just mention I was at AVIC too. It was a pleasure to hang out with uh, Councillor Pearson and and La Jeunesse and St. Pierre. And um, well, one of the events, interestingly, in relation to that previous uh, conversation we just had, uh, was that there was John Lidstone, the lawyer, led a Modernizing the Local Government Act workshop. So there is local governments at the AVIC and UBCM levels are investigating how to move forward. There's matters like uh, expansion, allowable uh, development cost charge, charges to include fire halls, police stations, recreation centers. There's some other modernization pieces um, related to, yeah, regional districts in particular need their own community charter. We at municipal level got ours in 2003, which Mr. Lidstone drafted a few years earlier. And, um, so Jen Ford, the UBCM president, was there, and her advice is that um, local municipalities need to share tangible examples of where the LGA is not working. So I think this letter we'll be sending to the ministers is, is an example of that. And ideally, there will be a collection of local examples utilized by AVIC and the, their working group to, uh, to bring forward. And yeah, so I could go on, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Councillor Lajeunesse. Uh, let's see, Oop, screen just went dead. I'll have to wait and look at my calendar. Oh. Okay, um, where was I? So, um on the 12th i also attended the emcs capstone projects and interviewed three young grade 12 students and was thoroughly impressed with with um, the state of our youth today i think they're they're um in better shape than I was when I was their age. I was a little bit uh, um, not as interested in school, but um, and then on that evening, I attended the party for the arts at uh, the Colwood Golf Course, Royal Colwood Golf Course, and that was hosted by Judith Cullington and others from the West Shore. Uh, they're working on getting a performing arts center somewhere in the West Shore, likely in Colwood. Um, and so that was interesting. Met some some good good people there doing some some good advocacy work in that in that region. Um, and on the 13th, um, I took um, our former premier or John from Langford, as he's now known, on a tour of uh, Camosun Innovates, where I used to work to show him the kind of work that's that's going on there. This is something that we talked about last year at the the Lions uh, fundraising uh, jail event, and it took that long for us to get together and and make it happen. But uh, I think he was suitably suitably impressed. Um, and then, of course, AVIC, um, always good to talk with the, the various people from around the region there and 
talk about what everyone else is doing. Uh, the John Jack's presentation that uh, Councillor Pearson mentioned, I just happened to run into him on my way to my car as he was driving out. And I told him how much his, his uh, how impactful I thought that his presentation was. And he told me that he would share it with me, which he did. And I think I emailed it out to everyone. And I also posted it on my social media account. So, and I would encourage people to have a look at it. Um, on the 18th, which was last Tuesday, I attended the SIP Municipal Partners meeting and they are working toward a regional um, economic development strategy and marketing strategy to market the, the entire region. Um, and I think this is a, an excellent approach. They're looking for materials from all of the various municipalities, uh, pictures and stories. Uh, they're calling it uh, Victoria Rising because people from other parts of the world don't necessarily know where Machosen is or View Royal or Soup, but Victoria is a known brand, but they still want to market the entire region under that banner. Um, and special counsel, we don't need to talk about that. Um, uh, the on Saturday, I attended the Sukarama, which was was interesting, had some interesting discussions. I got there kind of late and things were packing up, but still worthwhile. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Councillor McMath. Um, so through Crest, I've joined the post-disaster building task force. Um, I we just had our first meeting April 21st, and I'm happy to send you guys the previous minutes. We have our AGM coming up on May 17th, and I also was touching base on the radio towers um, out towards Renfrew. Part of the holdup is actually the whole holdup is BC High Shirel. So some of them are running off of generators, um, but the towers that are up right now, there's significant improvement in transmission and reception, including hitting other parts of other areas. That was sort of a side benefit. So Otter Point, for example, it's hitting other places. So they're seeing an increase in radio reception. And uh, once the AGM concludes, I'll send you guys the updates. Thank you very much. Councillor Beddows? No, I talked about uh, Sukarama earlier, so I have nothing more to add. You want to talk about Sea Park? I could. Uh, well, other than uh, we decided that the, for the 24 budget to go back to the public and ask for their input of what they would like to see when it comes to recreation in our community. Uh, the commission felt that uh, even though we're two years left in our old mandate because of the uh, heavy growth in our community, that we best have a look and uh, see further what, uh, what we need to get back from the community, see where we could put our dollars in the future. Well, that's about it. So the planning document that guides Sea Park and the, the work. So now that some things have landed in soup, like the sport box and FIFA World Cup coming out this way and we talked a little bit about hockey enrollment declining but it seems that it's reversing trends now so what do we start to need to plan for for the future so okay uh so Ms. temple touched on it earlier um we recently hosted the students from natori japan this is where we have a friendship agreement in place journey middle school has gone through some administrative changes so they weren't ready to launch the whole host program this year however the students did come to souk they spent the night in in the prestige hotel um and typically they're with the students they go to school they spend time they spend time their host families take them in and out and around and they do activities and the students come here for lunch and a bit of a visit and then they carry on and so they wanted to spend a day with us but a day in municipal hall i mean yay for us because we like this work but with translation and jet lag 
middle school, I don't know, not so exciting. So it was like, well, let's get out of here. Let's not do this. And so uh, with Miss Temple and with Journey, we were able to engage in a learning program at the South. Like how better to introduce uh, students into the territory and to welcome them at South. So the bus took them over to South Band Hall. Uh, it was during spring break. So some of our youth were available to join as well. Uh, there were four elders that did different activities. So from a nature walk to a Métis beating exercise to learning some sench off in. And also um, there was one more now, which I don't remember. There was drumming and dancing. Drumming and dancing. And then the Natory students also have a traditional dance of which they prepared and presented to us. Uh, lunch with Subway and also some bannock that had been prepared. So talked about the foods. And then we went to Whiff and Spit uh, to get, again, get outside and get moving onto the spit. From there, they, they went to the Stickleback, I believe, for supper. And then the next day, they went to Nanaimo and spent there before their return home. Uh, Mayor Yamada was unable to join the tour group. Um, airfare is still really expensive. And then when you add on all the different uh, charges and the like, it just didn't work out. However, um, Ms. Temple and I have since um, also followed up with Journey Middle School. They are in the process of getting ready for next year. They do believe the exchange is important and we'll be bringing that online. And uh, the intention is for our students to go to Natori Japan in 2024. So sometime, I think probably our spring break or around that time next year. So probably in September, they'll start their own internal fundraising and, and kick all that off. Um, in the meantime, in May of this year, would be roughly the 10 year anniversary of the devastation that hit uh, the the large the tsunami that devastated. It's been 10 years since then. You may recall that um, we had some impact here, but Canada sent materials and labor and uh, to help with um, the effort as many nations did, but Canada did. And in Natori, they built what is called the Maple Leaf Center uh, of where they fly the suit, they have the suit, the Canadian flag, we send them a souk flag, and they always try to showcase Canadian goods. So they have like Tim Hortons that they serve, um, which is interesting because the coffee in Japan is excellent, right? Like it comes right from Blue Mountains of Jamaica. And so to go there and to drink Tim Hortons coffee is, it's interesting. It's nice yeah, Canadian brand. It's just out of context sometimes when you have really good coffee there. But anyway, they're very proud to do that. The students here did a large, they've been doing art exchanges. So there was art from that Tory displayed in Journey Middle School. And what the gift was that students sent back was uh, sort of the outline of a buffalo and then individual mosaic pieces that fit together like a puzzle. And so they will be displaying that in the Maple Leaf Pavilion. Uh, in May, because it's the Canada, it's the, not sorry, it's the 10 year anniversary event. It's a big deal because they've also been in a lot of testing. Uh, some areas are now clear of radiation. They can resume harvesting activities and, and the like, whether it's oysters, which are popular in Matsushima Bay or different types of seaweeds and the like. So a lot of the concerns have been lifted. The Canadian ambassador is going to Natori for this May event. So we are going to be putting together a video. Uh, we've done some video exchanges over the years, but sometimes it's using iPhone devices and your mayor cycling, like, and theirs are so professionally done. Like we're doing our best here. So we are going to do a bit more and send a greeting and uh, send that over for their anniversary event. I have been invited to go to Japan for Natori's birthday. There's a significant event occurring on October the 1st. So I am going to go. I'm paying for it out of my pocket, though. I can't ask. I just, with the, the cost of things to ask for this trip, the previous trip that we were to go on, uh, Japan was going to pay for that. So you may recall that we were scheduled to go. We were going to go with the students. Our airfare and accommodation was going to be covered. There would be no impact here. 
Uh, however, that's changed. It took a long time to get refunds back from the airlines and the like. The hotel wasn't a big deal. Um, so I've decided that I, I would like to go uh, and it will be at my own personal expense. So I just wanted to share that with you because just sort of planning those dates there. Uh, and then next year, um, the Journey Middle School students will be resuming that trip and will then host students back and forth and then hopefully start to move towards a, a more formal sister city type of arrangement in the future. So that's one piece to share with you. Uh, in terms of the capstone projects that a few of us have referenced, this is something that the grade 12 students work on and part of their, the teachers grade the projects and part of theirs is to present to a member of the community. And that's where we're invited in to hear the students. So I heard three as well, very different, uh, diverse set of students, all extremely skilled, uh, very knowledgeable and like well put together. And to Councillor Lajeunesse's point, like, was I that put together in grade 12? Like, no, like even to do something like that and to share it with a complete stranger, well done. And that was every student, excellent work occurring there. It was a really good day. Uh, advocacy, we received a letter. You may recall, um, we sent a letter regarding um, MIST, the Mobile Youth Services Team. Uh, we've raised it here through Councillor Bateman. And we wrote a letter. And so the Solicitor General has written back now confirming that uh, the funding is in place for $130,000 for both the capital reach, sorry, the crime reduction and an exploitation diversion cred program and mobile youth services team uh, to provide services to at risk use in the capital region. Uh, is there 130,000, but it's one-time funding. So again, that one year, and we'll need to pick this up again for next year because it's not sustained funding. And that's sort of our challenge there is it's one year at a time. Um, a lot of changes occurring. Um, the RCMP have reached out. Um, they're having an event and they've invited both myself and our CAO to attend this one day workshop so we can understand what is going on in the world of RCMP and just there's a whole program. So we'll be going to that in Nanaimo in May. Um, if you're around on Monday, it's Music Monday in Souk. And so students will be coming to the Evergreen Mall and we'll be singing from about, I think 1245 onwards. I know it's the elementary, Souk Elementary. I think I'm starting to hear of other schools being in town. So it'll be at the Evergreen Mall. And uh, so we're all welcome uh, to be there and to cheer on our students. And you may also have recalled in years past that, or last year, I got a bit carried away in the drive through McDonald's for McHappy Day. Uh, that's coming up on May the 10th. It raises money for families needing support for medical, um, for, their for their children in medical. So I found it fascinating. Um, to be there. I've never worked in a drive through before. I had no responsibility other than to hand out the food and to press a button to clear. There's a lot going on there. A, eh? It's amazing how much they do there. But it's also interesting to hear how workers are being treated and how unkind and the sort of treatment that they're receiving at the window. And also just the snapshot you get into everyday life of our residents. Like what is going on in that moment? Sometimes the food is ready and you can, it's every moment there's somebody different with a different life story happening. And so it's interesting. It, I found it fascinating and, and quite interesting. So if you're available, um, they'll find something for us to do. The drive-through handing out the food is the most fun. And you just wish everyone a make happy day, which drives some people crazy. But I did it all the time, many times. Like, have a make happy day. So it's coming up. It's local. Great team of people working there. But they're in the front lines. They're not putting up. There's some outrageously unkind behavior that they're dealing with. And so just to also be at the receiving end of that, it's interesting. It's unkind, but it's unwarranted. So. Uh, kudos to them. So those are some highlights. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. And uh, we'll go from there. So on that note, we have a rise and report.
I put it up on the screen. Thank you. And so that would be that council rise and report that the Huggett report has been received by council and that council direct staff to, or pardon me, direct staff to proceed with the approved press release of the Huggett report summary with my counselor. Actually, we don't need to move this because we've already done that. It's just rising reporting now. So there's no other action required. Thank you for that. Anyway, so I'll move to you for adjournment, please. Moved by Councillor McMath, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. All in favor? That's unanimous.